we had the benefit of having someone who is a Tesla expert, um, and whose name is Rob Maurer. Rob is a good friend of Patrick's, and I'm going to ask Patrick to do a little bit more background and how they know each other, and then let, we'll let Rob talk. Rob's going to talk to us for first part of class, a little bit about what he does and, and in the space and his perspective on Tesla, and then we're gonna open up the Q&A. Patrick, take it away. Sure, thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for uh, allowing uh, a guest speaker. Uh, I, yeah, this kind of happened as a result of a lot of the interest around, around Tesla and then moving into the stock discussion and it finally clicked after class one day and David, you posted a discussion question about you know the valuation on the stock. I said, wait a minute, I know someone who who does this, uh, who, who's, who's quite knowledgeable in this space. So uh, I've, I've known Rob for a few years now. We're actually uh, former, former roommates. And uh, if anyone knows Rob, they know he loves Tesla. Uh, so he uh, started off as a really avid fan of the, of the company, of the technology, uh, researching it daily and scouring the internet for the latest and greatest information on Tesla um, and channeled that and turned that into a uh, at a daily podcast in which he did stock overviews, uh, gave updates on the company, his perspective, uh, as well as some uh, information about the, the, uh, the stock environment, investing, and just the company news. Um, so Rob has th that podcast called Tesla Daily, and he's, uh, and he's moved into that as a, as a full-time opportunity and really grown it into something pretty incredible with tons of high praise on, uh, on, on YouTube in the comments and uh, with all of the the uh, rapid increase in Tesla stock and attention right now. I think lots, uh, lots of great viewership and feedback from his uh, online community. So uh, I'll let Rob give a little bit more about his his uh, his bull case on Tesla, and then uh, and then background on his entrepreneurial efforts in the in the Tesla daily space. So uh, it should be really informative. Rob is known for being extremely detail oriented and uh, and having a great speaking voice, as you'll hear in just a moment. So uh, as as the online comments say. So uh, thanks everyone for letting him join. Uh, Rob, go ahead, take it away. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for the uh, glowing introduction, Pat. I appreciate it. So yeah, as Pat said, I started this podcast back in 2017 after sort of being a Tesla investor since 2013. And really what drove me to start the podcast was just uh, the amount of misinformation that was out there in the mainstream media at the time. So it seemed like every other day I would get text messages from friends complaining about some CNBC article about you know Tesla's battery fires or something like that where they're asking, oh my gosh, do I need to sell the stock because of this news? And oftentimes, you know, I reply to them and say, okay, here's like X, Y, and Z context that was missing. Um, and I just felt like that was happening so often. Um, and I was spending so much time researching Tesla that I could probably put that to good use by sharing some of that information more broadly. So that was sort of the original idea behind Tesla Daily is just to help people stay informed that maybe don't have time to spend multiple hours a day sort of researching the company and tracking all the news and sorting through all the, you know, what's accurate, what's not accurate, things like that. Uh, so I started that in August of 2017. So it's been about three years now. And over time, the listenership has just grown pretty steadily. Um, I think obviously interest in Tesla has picked up dramatically with the introduction of the Model 3, the more affordable electric sedan. So, um, and then obviously with the, over the last year, a lot of interest in the stock as well. So about a year ago, I ended up taking that full time. Um, with the help of just support from my listeners who have been amazing. Uh, started YouTube about probably eight months ago or so. I uh, have about 60,000 subscribers on YouTube now. Uh, just, I think, speaks to the tremendous interest in the company. Um, but yeah, as Pat said, I think today I just wanna quickly walk through sort of why I am an investor in Tesla and sort of the bull case um, as I see it. Obviously, we can't get to everything today. I'll just spend a few minutes here at the intro going through it. Then we can go to questions and answers. And then at the end, if we have some time, I can go through just sort of a little bit more on the actual business of uh, Tesla Daily. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here for Excel. Um, I mean, the bull case for Tesla is pretty simple. I'm sure you guys have talked about sort of bull and bear cases before. Um, but really what it comes down to is, so Tesla, the, really the case is that Transportation in general is going to be electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles over time. The reason it's going to electric is because the electric powertrain is just superior in terms of efficiency, performance, cost for performance, cost of fuel, safety. There's a lot of advantages to putting the, bat the battery pack in the bottom of the vehicle. It adds weight, keeps the center of gravity low. There's rigidity in terms of the structure of the vehicle that helps for side collisions and things like that. Um, so all of Tesla... Tesla's vehicles have scored five stars on pretty much every safety test that there is in all categories. 
So it's really just a disruption that's happening in the transportation industry is sort of the thesis there. And I think over time, a more and more significant chunk of the market is going to quickly uh, turn to electric because of those superiorities. And then the other, um, in terms of autonomous vehicles, um, as software continues to eat more and more of the world, uh, as neural net and deep learning continue to be more and more understood, uh, I think the, the progress in autonomous vehicles is going to continue at an exponential rate. Today, Tesla already has driver assist functionality that people are paying them a lot of money for to access with our autopilot suite and software. Uh, so they're already generating revenue and generating profit from that system today. But obviously over time, the goal for Tesla is to um, become fully autonomous and then eventually offer a robo taxi fleet that would essentially replace Uber with much lower cost because they're electric and there's no labor. So that's sort of the autonomous vehicle thesis. And then sort of the third part of Tesla is, which isn't really talked too much about, especially in the media, is just the energy component. So transportation going electric, autonomous, energy is going to renewable. So that's going to be a mix of solar, wind, and hydro. The cost for those just continue to come down over time. I think we've reached a point where with oil, natural gas, things like that, there's not a lot left to squeeze out there, but there's a lot of innovation that can still happen with these renewable energy sources. And it's just something that the world needs to transition to eventually. We can't rely on oil or finite resources forever. So um, not only are the costs beneficial in terms of how that disruption is going to play out, it's just something that sort of needs to happen for the world. Um, so with those renewable energy sources, obviously the problem is that the supply of energy or the power is uh, intermittent. So alongside the intermittency of that power source, you need storage. So you're obviously not going to generate solar power at night. You need some, some energy backed up to use at night. Uh, so that's going to come in the form of batteries, uh, whether that's in the grid or whether that's localized in terms of residential storage or some combination more likely of all those things. So that's sort of the overall thesis. Um, so what you can see here on the, on the screen is just the top 10 revenue companies in the world right now. Uh, so you'll notice that nine out of 10 of these are actually in the uh, oil and gas space or in the automotive space. So the segments that Tesla is playing in are extremely large markets, multi-trillion dollar markets, which means that there's a lot of potential for both disruption because a lot of these companies are established legacy type of companies that maybe aren't as disruptive or innovative as they were in the past. Um, and obviously they control a large market share. So <clears throat> there's a lot of potential there for Tesla to take share and take profit. So in terms of that share, Tesla is definitely the leader in electric vehicles. They actually own 80% of the market in the United States. So you can see a chart here uh, from carsalesbase.com. Uh, so 80% of the market share, they had 82% last year. It's been pretty consistent. And sort of the biggest thing that people don't really realize about this is that Tesla's actually at a disadvantage in terms of their competition with other electric vehicles. There is a $7,500 federal tax credit in the United States for the purchase of electric vehicles. Tesla is no longer eligible for that because the federal tax credit is capped at 200,000 vehicles per brand. So Tesla has burned through that pretty quickly. Um, and as of the middle of 2019, that started to phase out. So throughout or middle of 2018. So throughout 2019, the average subsidy for Tesla or the federal tax credit for Tesla was about $2,000 versus these other companies at roughly $7,500. So Tesla's already at about a $5,500 uh, disadvantage in the United States. And despite that, they still had an 80% market share, which just, I think, speaks to the tremendous lead uh, that Tesla has on their competition. Second place was Chevy with the Chevy Bolt, which actually came out before the Model 3. And that only had about 7% market share. So Tesla just continues to dominate um, and their domination worldwide is growing too. So in Europe, they had a 31% market share for the electric vehicle market last year. Um, and that was up from 2018, about 16% versus second place in Europe has about 12%. So they're about triple the, you know, the next runner up, even in Europe where they don't have localized manufacturing or anything like that, though they are building out Gigafactory Berlin, uh, which will be a localized vehicle and battery production facility for Tesla starting production next year. So similar thing in China, they've had lower market share over time, but that's growing significantly. Tesla's revenue in China in the second quarter was up over 100% year over year because they've just started production out of Gigafactory Shanghai. So similar to Gigafactory Berlin, that's gonna be a battery and vehicle factory and is already producing at a run rate of about 150,000 vehicles per year uh, and continuing to accelerate. And that's, uh, Tesla broke ground on that in January of 2019. 
So that's pretty much unprecedented in terms of large scale manufacturing for them to go from groundbreaking to that sort of vehicle run rate in basically a year and a half. Um, and Tesla's working on building out factories, you know, all over the world right now. They've got Gigafactory Berlin, Gigafactory Shanghai. And then I'm sure as a lot of you guys have heard, they just announced a Gigafactory in Texas uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so they plan to get that into production next year as well. So the pace that Tesla's growing at is just not slowing down at all. Elon has said that they, uh, they want to continue to grow at 50% per year, basically in perpetuity until they hit about 20 million vehicles per year, sort of by 2030. So we'll talk about that a bit here too. In terms of their lead in autonomous vehicles, so this is a chart put together by Lex Friedman. This captures the number of miles that are driven by Teslas um, that are equipped with their autopilot hardware. So Tesla basically has the capability of harboring all the data from all of those miles driven. So in Tesla's case right now, they're over 3 billion miles uh, driven by these vehicles with this autopilot hardware, uh, which contains eight cameras, a variety of radars, ultrasonic sensors, things like that. They don't use a LiDAR sensor, uh, which is a bit different than other strategies in the autonomous vehicle market. But Tesla's philosophy is that really with enough data, they're going to be able to train their neural net to the degree that a LiDAR won't necessarily be required. Um, so that's really the play here is Tesla is basically shipping as many vehicles into the market as they can. Those vehicles then return a lot of data for them, which is incredibly value, valuable for Tesla. And tex Tesla actually gets to charge their customers to go and collect this data for them through the profits that they generate on their vehicles. So it's a really nice flywheel effect that just scales up even more and more as Tesla's production and deliveries grow. Um, so for example, Tesla's at about 3 billion miles in terms of the autopilot miles driven. They're collecting you know, about seven and a half miles per day from these vehicles. Uh, for example, really the second place in autonomous vehicles from my perspective, obviously this is all um, my own opinion, but uh, Waymo is probably second place right now. They, for example, have um, 20 million miles collectively driven across all their vehicles. So 20 million versus 3 billion. And Tesla's collecting about seven and a half million miles per day. Waymo has different sensor suites. They do use LiDAR. So some of that data may be considered more valuable. That's really a toss up in terms of just how you expect, you know, the development of autonomous systems to play out. Um, but for me, I think it's really all about the data and that's what Tesla's pursuing and no one else is really been able to implement a strategy where they can get the sort of scale in the marketplace to collect that data like Tesla has. It's just way too costly. Um, for example, Waymo can't pay $100,000 for all their vehicles without a customer buying that uh, for them to go travel the globe uh, like Tesla has. So that's sort of my perspective on why Tesla's leading in electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. In terms of the energy businesses, Tesla offers the lowest cost in solar installations right now in the United States by about 20 or 30%. Um, so that's a recent price cut. They aren't currently the market share leader in terms of installations, but that business has been through some, some changes since Tesla acquired SolarCity in 2016. And over time, I believe Tesla with these lower costs and just sort of the benefit of Tesla's brand recognition and the scale of the business, I think should continue to accelerate very rapidly. As I said, Elon expects the, the vehicle business to grow at about 50% compound each year. And for solar and energy, he expects them to grow uh, both more significantly, both more quickly than that. Uh, so they should become bigger parts of the business over time and should have really incredible growth rates. Uh, and that's really what we've seen in the storage business too. So Tesla is installing about 400 megawatt hours of energy storage each year through the form of residential storage with their Powerwall product, which is, I believe, probably going to misquote this, but somewhere around a 10 kilowatt hour battery that um, people can just put in their home. They tie it to a, a solar system or even just directly to the grid to, you know, charge up when energy is cheaper and then discharge when energy is more expensive. So you can play that arbitrage opportunity a little bit there uh, to help return the cost of the actual power wall. And then Tesla offers utility scale products um, like the power pack and the mega pack, which is a new three megawatt hour uh, sort of turnkey project that they can, you know, implement really quickly if utilities want to implement that uh, storage. So I think Tesla is really, you know, positioned to be a dominant player across these huge markets. And that's essentially the thesis in general. But I think what a lot of people get hung up on is, okay, Tesla's leading all these things, but they're valued at, you know, $300 billion right now. So I do want to go a little bit through that valuation because I think a lot of people think of it, okay, it's, it's just a bubble. People are just way too hyped up on this. Oh, here we go. So this is just... Um, basically Tesla's aspirations to, for how quickly they want to grow. 
by uh, 2030. So that's 50% per year in 2025. That puts them at 4 million vehicles. Elon has clarified that yes, that is at least their target. And then about 20 million vehicles by 2030, uh, which would have them basically twice the size of the largest manufacturers today um, at about 10 million with uh, Volkswagen and Toyota. So if, if we think about Tesla right now, they're building out the factories, as I said, in Europe, in China, and a second factory here in the United States. Those factories by 2023, probably at the latest, should be capable of production of at least a million and a half vehicles per year. Tesla's production capacity right now is about 800,000, though with the impacts of coronavirus this year, they'll probably only deliver somewhere just above 500,000 for the year. But as they go into next year, Gigafactory Shanghai continues to ramp, Gigafactory Berlin comes online, Gigafactory Texas comes online, their production capacity is going to accelerate dramatically and that should allow them to increase deliveries dramatically as well. Tesla's generally not demand constrained as evidenced by their second quarter deliveries, which were only down 5% versus the entire automotive market being down 40%. So it just speaks to how much latent demand there is that Tesla can't fulfill uh, with their production capacity today. So if we look at like in between 2022 and 2023, for example, and we assume, okay, these factories come online, they've doubled Tesla's production right now, Tesla producing a million and a half vehicles per year. And let's say that each of those vehicles, the average selling price is about $45,000. So that would mean that Tesla would be generating $68 billion in revenue. If we assign a 23% gross margin to that, that's a little bit over $15 billion in gross profit. Right now, automotive revenue is about 15 or 85% of Tesla's business. And then 15% comes from solar and storage, as I mentioned, and then service and the sale of used cars, things like that. So any other portion of the business has so far been about 15%. As I said, Tesla does expect that to grow more quickly over time. But for our example today, let's just assume that that you know, stays stagnant at about 15%. On $68 billion in revenue, if we throw another 15% on top of that, that's another 12 billion. So in a couple of years, in 2022 or 2023, Tesla should be generating about $80 billion in revenue. Um, <clears throat> and right now, so far, they've run those other businesses pretty much at, at um, just break even gross margin. So they're not generating much profit on them. I do think over time they will start to do that. But again, for our example, we'll be conservative here and we'll just assume that that additional $12 billion, $12 billion in revenue uh, doesn't generate any extra profit for Tesla. So $15.5 billion um, in terms of profit. So that's where I want to get into what is, I think, the most probably underappreciated aspect of Tesla and something that is not talked about nearly enough. And that is the operating leverage that they have generated over time. So here we can see just the quarters, each quarter, quarterly results for Tesla since 2016, which would have been before the Model 3 started ramping up. That happened in mid-2017. Um, and then I have the years down here as well. So we can see that in 2016, Tesla generated $7 billion in revenue, and their operating expenses that year were $2.3 billion. If we fast forward to last year, 2019, Tesla generated $25 billion in revenue, and their operating expenses were only $4.1 billion. So they were able to grow their revenue by 251% and only increase their operating expenses by 83%. So that's referred to as operating leverage. That's economies of scale in a nutshell. As you scale up, you generate you know, more capability to leverage the infrastructure that you've already built out. And for Tesla, because they are growing so rapidly, they actually are building out infrastructure ahead of capturing revenue. So even these operating expenses are actually inflated because they have to hire people for Right now for Gigafactory Shanghai or Gigafactory Berlin, they've even posted job listings for Gigafactory Texas, and they just bought that land a couple weeks ago. And obviously those projects don't generate revenue right away, but they still hit the costs here. So as Tesla goes into the future, they're going to continue to generate that operating leverage, and they're actually going to generate revenue from the projects that they have going today that are already costing them in terms of capital expenditures, which hits depreciation, or in terms of operational expenses. Uh, which lowers their gross profit or their net income. So basically the point here is that I think this will continue over time. So if we just look at a quick example of what could be possible, back to our $80 billion in revenue, um, with $15.5 billion in profit, and we assume, let's just say that for selling general and administrative costs and for research and development costs, they basically just level out here at where they are. So the blue is their SG&A. If we say that levels out at 10%, and then the orange is their R&D expenses. And we say that levels out at 5%. These are both conservative figures in my estimation. If we apply that to the $80 billion in revenue, that would leave Tesla with approximately, 
um, about $12 billion in operating expenses between the two. So about three and a half billion dollars in operating income. So in terms of how that would actually be valued, if we look at Amazon and we look at their price in 2017, Amazon had about $4 billion in operating profit that year. And they were valued at over $700 billion by the market. So Tesla today at $300 billion with a very, very clear path with very conservative assumptions for the next two years to generating the same amount of operating income that Amazon generated when Amazon was valued at a $700 billion um, market cap. So if Tesla does this, which again, I believe is conservative, theoretically the market should value it similarly or even more highly than they valued Amazon because the market for Tesla is bigger. As we talked about, energy and automotive are nine in the top 10 revenue generating companies in the world. Um, and Tesla's growth rate will actually be faster than Amazon. So theoretically, it should receive a higher multiple than what was applied to Amazon. So even just a couple of years in the future, if Tesla is able to pull this off, which I think, again, is conservative, then the valuation is definitely, you know, it fits within the relative valuation of other high growth companies that we have seen in the past. Now, you could argue that those companies were overvalued, but the returns on those companies have actually outpaced the overall market. Um, so that's probably a separate discussion just on uh, the total valuation of the stock market. But relative to other companies, Tesla seems to me relatively undervalued based on some pretty conservative assumptions here. And I'll take that one step further. I think Tesla is going to continue to generate more operating leverage. Um, they have the Model Y coming on right now. That should, once it's ramped up, that's a crossover SUV. That should be a similar price range to the Model 3. Once that's ramped up, it should really essentially double Tesla's revenue and they're not going to need to double their operating expenses. So I think the operating leverage is just going to continue. As we said, they, you know, basically three and a half times the revenue with only increasing their operating expenses 80%. So even if we assume that operating expenses double and research and development costs somewhat almost double up 80%, then instead of the three and a half billion dollars in operating profit on those one and a half million vehicles, Tesla really could generate, um, about seven to $8 billion in operating profit under very conservative assumptions, still, still having SG&A and R&D basically double. So that's sort of the potential of the business. And I think the question is like, okay, why, why is Tesla always valued so much highly, so much more highly than other automakers? You know, Toyota is sort of the leading, leading valuation automaker right now. They're somewhere usually in between 150 billion or 200 billion in terms of market cap. So Tesla already, even with their small scale, is the most valuable automaker by market cap. So the question then is, okay, comparing Tesla to the other automakers, the valuation is, you know, too high. Tesla's doing things, as I mentioned in the beginning, though, that other automakers are not. So the first thing that Tesla is doing is the vertical integration. So a lot of automakers, especially these days, rely heavily on their suppliers. They rely on, for example, the Chevy Bolt is a great example of it. They had LG make their pretty much their entire powertrain. So the battery pack um, and things like that versus Tesla, they really just integrate fully throughout the entire thing. They make as, as far down as making their own seats and the materials for the seats. So Tesla's heavily vertically integrated. Tesla also doesn't rely on a dealership network. They sell direct to customers. So if you think about the other automakers and their valuation, they're sharing that valuation with the dealerships. They don't get to capture the entire value chain like Tesla does. So it's from point of sale all the way down from manufacturing. Tesla is extending the vertical integration and capturing more of the profit throughout. So that's a huge reason that Tesla has a greater profitability outlook than other automakers. They're just not capturing that profit in the supply chain. And then the second thing, which is really the biggest, is Tesla is really a technology company. And some people are going to argue that, but you can't argue the fact that right now Tesla sells a software option on their vehicles for $8,000. About 25% of people opt for that, which is about $2,000 per car. Tesla can't actually recognize all that revenue right now because the full feature set is not delivered, but they do recognize about half of it. So over time, as they continue to improve their autopilot functionality, deliver new features, the amount of revenue that they can recognize and the take rate on that option is just going to increase. So if we think about even just the $2,000, if Tesla is selling a million and a half vehicles in two years and each vehicle on average, they get to recognize $2,000 in additional revenue, that's $3 billion in just straight net income that other automakers just have no hope of ever capturing because they're not innovating in software like Tesla is. 
they're not selling $8,000 software options. They're not getting that high margin revenue that software allows for. So that's really the differentiator between Tesla's valuation and other automakers alongside obviously the growth rate, other automakers, you know, they don't have much of a growth rate, if any. Um, and the outlook for them is just, is pretty dismal having to convert their entire hundred year of investments into, um, from legacy ice manufacturing, internal combustion engine manufacturing over to electric vehicles. So Tesla's a pure play. It's positioned well for sort of the new economy of transportation and the other automakers are not. They just have all those sunk costs that they're going to have to deal with. And they're, you know, obviously way behind Tesla in terms of the powertrain and manufacturing and sort of everything that goes along with scaling uh, electric vehicles. So long-winded, pretty quick to go through all that stuff. Um, but that's sort of my bull case in, in a nutshell. I think Tesla, even right now, is still pretty incredibly undervalued. And I continue to believe that they have the potential to be one of the biggest companies in the world, uh, if not the biggest, within the decade. So I think at that point, if we want to just open it up for any questions, and then I can talk a little bit more about sort of the Tesla daily stuff at the end if we have time. Great. So I guess we all need to rush, run out tomorrow and buy our Tesla stock. <laughs> great. Not financial great advice. Bull. No, I, Rob, great bull case. <laughs> Um, there was actually, sorry, I just missed one thing in my notes that I do want to mention really quickly. And this is on sort of the competition angle. So as you can see on the Excel, um, this is Volkswagen's target. They plan to sell 22 electric, 22 million electric vehicles in the next decade. If we think about the automotive market, it's generally 80 to 100 million vehicles per year. So by 2030, there's going to be about 800 million new vehicles sold. VW plans to only sell 22 million. This is the largest car manufacturer in the world. They plan to sell 22 million electric vehicles by that time of the 800 million vehicles that will be sold. So they're leaving that that's 3% of the market. If we look at a company like BMW, their target is four and a half million. And these are their targets. There's no guarantee that they're going to hit them. They could fall short like they have historically with their electric vehicle targets. So if we add up all these legacy car makers and we put their electric vehicle targets on paper, they're in total targeting to make about 10% of the market electric vehicles by 2030. Of those 800 million vehicles, maybe 80 million at best, probably even much lower than that. Um, so basically that's leaving 90% of the market there for Tesla to take. And that's why demand is just not a concern because Tesla's going to continue to drive prices down. They're going to continue to improve the value proposition of their offering with more um, robust software and things like that. And the market is just ripe. Like in the automotive industry, because the lead times are so long, we already know what competitors are going to be doing in 2022 and 2023. There's no surprise that's going to happen because you just need so much investment and so much time to scale up manufacturing um, and things like that. So it's just a very clear disruption that's going to happen. And the market is just there for the taking. And Tesla's really the only one pursuing that to the full degree, aside from a few Chinese automakers as well that are new. All right, so that'll that'll wrap it up then. <laughs> Compelling arguments, excellent presentation of arguments, Rob. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, you know, I don't consider myself a Tesla expert, but I certainly follow it. And you made a number of points in your presentation that I was not aware of. Um, I've yeah. heard the operating leverage comment before, but I never saw it in numbers. And seeing it in numbers as you presented it made it very, very compelling. So That's great. I can I'll ask Rob it. questions for the next hour, but the job, the, the, my role is to facilitate. So, and, and you guys have, and you guys have priority. So um, first of all, I, I want to thank Rob for what I thought was an extremely compelling and interesting presentation. Um, and it's very clear. He knows his stuff about this company. Um, you know, something Rob nor Pat mentioned was um, you know, Rob also is uh, works for, um, if you, you guys have probably heard me talk about Jim Cramer, who's a CNBC, um, um, one of the CNBC, has a program on CNBC is, and, is a, uh, uh, and is one of the announcers on CNBC, but he also owns um, a number of different online companies that um, charge for content, some that I actually subscribe to. And Rob is, Rob has been, um, they, they've asked Rob to join them to be their, um, to be one of their experts in the area of Tesla since it's such a hot stock. Um, and such a fascinating company, which is, uh, again, is not surprising given what just Rob presented. So I'm gonna shut up and let you guys ask questions of Rob. This is your opportunity. I can go. 
David, I'm I've already told I told Robbie he had we had one go we had one race car driver in this in this class. So you got to You got to have something. Yeah, I, I thought it was an awesome presentation. Um, really makes you want to go buy some Tesla stock <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I think you hit it spot on. At least from from my knowledge, like. Uh, with the battery packs, you know, adding weight and the weight is so low that that actually helps their safety a lot. Um, that's always something we're thinking about in racing. But um, yeah, I guess I was, I just had questions about like the infrastructure. Like I have no doubt that Tesla will, will be able to scale up its operations and actually produce the cars it needs to. Um, I just wonder if the infrastructure is going to be there um, to support it, given that it's just it's slow moving, it seems like, at least right now. Sure. Um, maybe in terms of infrastructure, do you mean like the stores infrastructure or charging infrastructure or supply chain or? Yeah, or sorry. All the I, above? Meant, I meant the charging infrastructure. Okay. Yeah, sure. So Tesla has a supercharger network, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I think they have, you know, more than 1,500 stations worldwide. And each of those stations has somewhere between five to 40 different charging plugs at them. Uh, so Tesla's basically growing that, again, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but somewhere between 50 to 100% year over year in general. Um, and, and I think the thing about the charging stations is you don't need as many of them as you would gas stations, for example, because a lot of people are gonna be charging at home. And over time, you know, apartments and condos and things like that are gonna make charging for vehicles more accessible because they're just going to have to because that's what their customers are going to want. So I think it's going to be an effort both between Tesla and um, probably third party companies. There are a lot out there right now like EVgo and ChargePoint uh, that are working on building out infrastructure. Um, so I think right now in terms of so I guess back to the main point, you don't necessarily need as many, as many charging stations because a lot of times you're really only needing to charge if you're going on a, a really long trip, which, you know, people want the capability of doing that, but the amount of times that they're actually doing that per year is, is pretty low. You know, maybe you're making a trip that's more than 300 miles uh, once or twice a year. Obviously people would have exceptions to that uh, depending on their use cases for their vehicles, but oftentimes people are just going to, you know, plug in every night like they would with their phone uh, and be ready to go the next day. And that's, that's really what you need is really, and you can do that with any, you know, any outlet. Um, you're not going to get a lot just plugging into like a normal wall outlet, but you could, you can get a couple, two to three miles of charge per, per hour. So, you know, overnight, that's probably going to generate enough for your commute. Um, but you can easily, you know, install an adapter that would either tie into like a washer um, wiring, washer dryer wiring. Um, and then you can, you know, easily recoup the, the full charge of the battery overnight. Um, so it's going to be a combination of both like these fast charging stations that are built out by Tesla and third parties and just a lot more developments of home charging infrastructure. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, if you get 240 volt or 480 volt charging, then you're, you're pretty good to go. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, so I just had a follow up question, but the, yeah. um, one of the articles we read was talking about Tesla's vision and part of that was, uh, autonomous vehicles and then letting people share vehicles based on that autonomy, um, which I think is a great idea. Um, you know, cars are just sit idle for most of their life. But I'm wondering now it's like, I wonder if society is like ready for to share vehicles like that. Like it's one thing in an Uber, you don't own the car and you're sort of sharing it. It's another thing to like, watch your car drive off without you. <laughs> I, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. So Tesla is sort of, they have this sort of series of master plans, they call it. So Elon published the first one in 2006, basically saying like, okay, we're going to build the Tesla Roadster, which is a really expensive sports car. We're going to use the profits from that to build the Model S, which is a slightly more affordable car and use the profits from that to build the Model 3. And then doing that, we're going to supply, uh, supply renewable energy with solar. So they've sort of checked all the boxes on that first master plan. The second master plan, the key component of that is to enable uh, vehicles to make money for their owners. So that's what you're talking about here with, you know, sort of the ride sharing. You just, you know, send your car off to work and it comes back and, you know, generate some money for you. So I think 
I think you're right. I think a lot of people are not going to be super interested in that, especially, you know, maybe the earlier Tesla buyers that are maybe a little bit more in the, the luxury space or the premium space in terms of the price band. Maybe they, they don't need, you know, the extra income from that the, the robo taxi would generate for them. Um, but it does create a really compelling business proposition. So, you know, if you think about the, the returns you're going to get on, on an investment like that, a robo taxi, you know, it might cost you $40,000. And that could generate you a dollar a mile in terms of actual profit. So that's pretty compelling. You know, you're going to make 10 grand a year at least. And uh, so in in three years, you have a return on investment and then you're just printing 10 grand a year. So without really having to do anything, maybe you have to clean your vehicle or, you know, give it a place to park at night. But there's going to be a lot of businesses that, you know, scoop up as many robo taxis as they can and deploy them. So even if it's not, necessarily personal, you know, use case for everybody. Uh, the, the business case is such that whether it's individuals doing this or whether it's businesses doing this, um, there's enough of a return on the investment to, you know, warrant, warrant the use case, I guess. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Hey. Uh, so how, like, because uh, I know that even uh, Elon Musk uh, has accepted that Tesla product should be, it has decreased because of the limited supply of the batteries. And we all know that uh, because uh, I think China is a major producer of the lithium hydroxide, which is now 79% of the world uh, like, uh, of lithium hydroxide is produced by China. And due to this trade war and even the, the mineral which is needed to produce this lithium is cobalt, which is uh, not extracted in US, uh, which is like the major, I think, Dominican Republic uh, and Russia and Philippines and all these countries. So how that is going to affect because everything is again comes to the battery because you need a battery. So how yep. are they going to deal with this? Yeah, that's a really great question. That's Tesla's biggest constraint for sure is the accelerated, um, the acceleration in the, in the supply chain for batteries. So uh, Elon actually talks about this on most earnings calls. Last last call, we talked about nickel specifically. So Tesla uses uh, a nickel cobalt um, aluminum cathode in their batteries. So those are um, the, the most constrained one of those right now is uh, nickel. And Tesla projects that to be the most constrained in the future. Uh, lithium is actually relatively easy to acquire from multiple different sources. And there's relatively little lithium in the battery. So it should be, that shouldn't end up being the constraint, but some of these other, uh, other minerals that maybe just don't have the mining capacity up right now for, you know, maybe let's call it 5 million electric vehicles per year or something like that. They're just going to have to continue to build out as rapidly as possible. And Tesla is actually, you know, Elon pushes for that on the earnings call. He says, you know, if there's any nickel mining companies out there, like we will give you an amazing contract for many years if you just like ramp up production of your nickel mines. Uh, So they're definitely pushing for that. That's definitely a huge constraint for them. One of the things Tesla is doing, though, is differentiating in their supply chain. So for most of their vehicles, they're going to use that nickel cobalt aluminum battery type because that is the most energy dense and power dense. But something that Tesla has found is they've created enough efficiency through the rest of the design of their vehicle, whether that's aerodynamic efficiency or efficiency within the electric motors, anywhere in the powertrain, even things like heating, venting, uh, heating and air conditioning, um, things like that. They've they've, uh, innovated in those spaces to create much more efficient vehicles. And they've made so much progress there that they actually are able to use less dense energy batteries now. So uh, one of those is lithium iron phosphate, so LFP. They are starting to use that from their China production with Gigafactory Shanghai later this year. So then they'll have you know a differentiated supply chain. Some of their vehicles will use the nickel cobalt aluminum. Some of them will use the lithium iron phosphate, uh, which allows them to ramp more quickly because they have those sort of dual supply chains both ramping up at the same time. So it is it's a good one to watch. I think you know anyone that follows Tesla closely is, has got their eye on that because that's likely to be the biggest constraint. Uh, something that's really exciting is Tesla is going to have a battery day um, on September 22nd is currently when it's scheduled. And they're supposed to walk 
sort of investors and people that are interested in the business through all of this, like how Tesla plans to um, sort of streamline this and eventually ramp up to terawatt hours of battery production, which is what would be needed for something on the scale of uh, 20, 20 million vehicles per year. So I definitely recommend, I'm sure all you guys would be really interested in that. That'll be on the, hopefully on the 22nd, if it doesn't get rescheduled from sort of travel restrictions and things like that from coronavirus. But um, yeah, they'll, they'll give a lot of, a lot of uh, missing, missing information on that. And like I said about vertical integration, Tesla, they're going to start making their own manufacturing uh, or manufacturing their own battery cells. Right now they are supplied from companies like Panasonic, LG, CATL in China, uh, Samsung sometimes. So Tesla is going to actually start making their own battery cells and eventually they could actually um, vertically integrate all the way down into mining. That is something that Elon has talked about in, in the past. Uh, so they're, they're definitely aware of the constraints and trying to address them as best they can. So I have a question. Secret play behind the boring company then? Um, I don't know. I haven't considered that, but I guess I don't see why not. Elon sort of always ties his ventures together like that. Like there's a lot of collaboration between SpaceX and uh, Tesla. Even before this, we were just talking about um, sort of just the materials overlap that they, uh, the two companies have and sort of that shared development uh, definitely benefits both. So I think Elon, whenever he makes a company, his, his whole goal is Mars. So sort of every company that he's involved in, I guess, setting aside Neuralink, um, really has a, you know, something to do with Mars. So the boring company, obviously, you know, making tunnels on Mars are going to be very important. Uh, SpaceX getting there. And then obviously you need to use an electric vehicle on Mars because of the differences in the atmosphere. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that came into play with mining either. Um, I have a question. So do you think right now Tesla is towards the end of their innovation phase and now they're entering their growth phase where they're going to be focusing on ramping up production, streamlining uh, manufacturing to keep up with the demand that they created? Or do you foresee that the innovation will continue as powerful as it has been the last few years? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's going to be a bit of both. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be, you know, as, as disruptive now as it has been. You know, for example, the Model 3 starts at, you know, $37,000. When the Roadster came out, it was 100000 plus. I don't see, I don't, you know, in eight years, we're not going to see $10,000 electric vehicles that have 250 miles of range. So if you look at it from a cost for performance perspective, I think the innovation does, does naturally slow down a little bit as it just approaches those, you know, those limits. Um, but there's still a ton of innovation in, in manufacturing. So this is something that Elon talks about a lot on the earnings calls is that, you know, for an, for an auto, for a car, and even for an electric vehicle, a lot of the innovation has already happened. Like they've already found the ideal form factors pretty much. You know, there's these little tweaks over time. And certainly there's a lot of opportunity specifically with batteries. Uh, but at a certain point, you just can't make a more aerodynamic vehicle and you just can't make a more efficient electric motor. So you're just going to approach those limits. But what Tesla can do, which is really going to, you know, their mission is to accelerate the advent of sustainable transportation. The biggest way to do that is just to make it more affordable. So what Tesla's really focused on is innovation and manufacturing that's going to allow them to cut costs out of that whole system, which I think is really exciting because it's an area that I think has, you know, been largely ignored for 20 or 30 years as more of the uh, human capital and human talent has just shifted into software. So I think Tesla's getting people really excited about the innovation potential with manufacturing um, and they're able to attract some of that talent back into it. Um, and I think that's going to lead to just a lot of disruption and innovation, implementation of artificial intelligence, automation uh, within manufacturing. Elon says that he thinks that, you know, the, the processes right now in terms of the, the volume density of manufacturing can be improved uh, 100x or a, a, a 10x or 100x. So, you know, the footprint of a, of a facility today that's producing 800,000 vehicles per year, which is the maximum, theoretically then could produce, you know, 8 million or 80 million vehicles per year. Obviously, that's probably a stretch, but that's just sort of the idea of, of what Tesla's focused on and, and getting to. And, and that's obviously going to cut costs. They're really focused on, on resources in one end, car out the other end, and then getting that as close to the customer just to, 
you know, cut down on shipping things back and forth across the world, which right now they've had to do. Um, so that's another reason I'm really bullish is because as Tesla gets uh, manufacturing localized in China and in Europe, and then even in closer to the Eastern coast of the United States, they're going to just be able to cut out a lot of that back and forth uh, that adds a lot of cost. So kind of a long winded answer, but yeah. Yeah, I agree. And also, especially with the manufacturing piece, because that'll cut down their operating costs significantly too. Yeah. Which is so exciting because they're already pretty low and they're already generating good operating leverage that I think people are going to be really uh, shocked and surprised by it. Hey Rob, just wondering. So I would say Tesla or maybe it's more Elon Musk marketing strategies, uh, the low cost, high impact, high influence. Do you think that's sustainable as Tesla continues to grow? Um, or do you think they're gonna have to reallocate a lot more dollars to, to marketing, especially if they again, continue to grow around the world? Sure. <laughs> The Tesla community is very conflicted on this point. Personally, I'm relatively pro advertising. Uh, I was a marketing major. So for me, I sort of naturally just see the benefits of it. I think Tesla can do a really good job of explaining how they are different from other companies and other products versus, you know, a lot of advertising is just sort of putting a product in front of you. I think Tesla's got a lot of opportunity to educate people. You know, there are still people that don't understand that you don't need to put gas in a Tesla which is, you know, we're almost a decade into Tesla selling products into the market now. And there's still, you know, a large portion of people that, that don't realize that. So I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done. I have no problem with Tesla paying for some of that education. Um, Elon has had conflicting comments on, the, on it in the past, but he's been consistent saying that uh, Tesla will at some point probably have to advertise. So I think if it comes back to the financials, yes, that could have an impact that maybe isn't being accounted for right now, but I think it would pale in comparison to uh, sort of the other operational leverage that they're able to generate. And I think Tesla will do it in a, a pretty innovative way like they have with other things, um, hopefully in, in a way that's not just, you know, oh, look at this like nice looking car drive by. Uh, there's just a lot more to speak to, uh, which, you know, comes to having a great product. And that's what really what Tesla has, you know, lived on so far. Uh, but eventually, yeah, I think they're going to have to start telling people, you know, a little bit more aggressively. Your marketing. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That's actually really interesting because um, You're free <laughs> I know. And like, there's no BMW daily podcast. There's no GM daily podcast. Like no one would listen to that. It's just the fact that I can sustain myself with this sort of a business is I think a testament just to, you know, how disruptive and how interested people are in in Tesla as a company, which is a sign in and of itself, as you point out. Thank you. Rob, our, our class, our class and our focus is around growth. Um, and you know, you've made a pretty compelling argument that Tesla's got a lot of places where they can grow going forward. Um, who do you view as, a legitimate competitor to Tesla because the automakers with the data you presented earlier don't seem to be that and they're they still think that they can hold on you know they're, they're still living the innovators dilemma in, in many respects but it you know you you know some of the Chinese companies that have you know that that are gaining some uh, traction you know who do you see as a potential competitor or the, the biggest threat to Tesla Sure. So I think we can start in the U.S. And I guess maybe let's just preface this, preface this with I think Tesla has an amazing lead. And I think other automakers are going to struggle. In terms of the legacy, they have to convert all their legacy assets to this new infrastructure, which no management company wants to do. And a lot of these you know, companies have, have people that just aren't going to be around to you know, see that through. They're maybe looking at the next four or five years of their career. And that's really all they're focused on. They're not looking at a 20 year vision. Um, so they're incentivized just to maximize profits for that period of time and maximize their compensation versus a company like Tesla from day one, you know, they've been about this mission of accelerating the advent of sustainable transportation. So they don't get distracted by things like that, uh, which allows them and their investors to fully support the investments that are required versus other companies really don't have that luxury. Uh, so I think the legacy competitors are, you know, in a pretty, pretty difficult situation that I don't see a lot of great answers to, uh, in terms of new upstarts, 
Tesla was sort of unique in that they didn't have to compete with Tesla. Uh, anyone new into the market has to now, you know, they have to create something that is more compelling than what Tesla has to offer. But Tesla's already gone through a couple decades of iteration and uh, innovation on electric vehicles. They've already reached scale to the point of being profitable now. Um, they're, they've got their original vehicles now coming off of warranty, which is actually a huge burden on a new company. They have to offer a warranty on their vehicles and they're not actually generating any income from service. It's actually a cost out for them. Um, so it's just an extremely difficult path to like manage through that, which, you know, Tesla was knocked for years for their lack of profitability going through that process. Um, you know, really it took 17 years or so for them to get to the point where they now are profitable. Uh, another company doesn't have 17 years to do that. So I think it's just a really, a really challenging situation. I think, you know, the best hope is for them to sort of play in the markets that Tesla is not playing in. So I would recommend maybe like the ultra luxury categories, uh, like Rolls Royce, Tesla's not going to compete with something in that space, uh, Ferrari, things like that. Um, maybe more luxury interiors. I think Mercedes Benz, if they, you know, had any interest in doing electric vehicles, there would be a lot of customers uh, that would be interested in sort of that more premium interior than what Tesla is yeah. going to offer. So I think there are ways to differentiate, but it's not going to be a big portion of the market and that's going to not really allow for much scale. So I think the best, the best competition is probably going to come from China because just as, as sort of China is structured, they're willing to make those difficult investments and they're willing to go through that period of pain uh, for however long it takes to, you know, reap the reward. So um, I, I look as I look to them as the biggest competitors and they're also just very focused on transitioning to renewable energy in general. They've seen firsthand the impacts of, you know, smog in their cities and things like that and the health costs of that to their citizens. So they're extremely motivated to support the investments in electric vehicles and support that transition, um, which they've been very supportive of Tesla as well. But some of the domestic manufacturers there, I just did an episode a couple of days ago on Xpeng Motors. So they are, um, they're just now starting to, or they're just now filing for listing on the U S stock exchange. Um, and I think they've got a pretty good product from, from what we can tell so far, their powertrain seems to be relatively close in efficiency to Tesla. They're maybe not getting quite the same performance out of it. They're definitely not profitable at this point in time. So I think they're sort of undercutting costs that they can't really afford to, but again, they're willing to go through that period of pain to come out the other side. Uh, so they're definitely one to watch. And I think, you know, Neo is another one that gets a lot of attention. I'm, I'm not as excited about them personally. Um, but yeah, I think, I think China is the one to watch. And then we have companies like Rivian. So Rivian is a, an upstart EV maker. They're backed by Amazon. Uh, so Amazon has an order from them for about a hundred thousand delivery vans. Uh, they're trying to make a pickup truck, which was a good strategy until Tesla unveiled the cyber truck. Now I think it's a little bit more, more difficult to find that path, but, um, yeah, that's, that's sort of my thoughts on, on competition. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Any so, other questions? Yeah, actually I do have one. Um, so you, you talked about Rivian. I'm just, I, I'm curious to hear your opinion on um, Rivian. Obviously they've been invested in by Amazon, but one you didn't mention was um, Ford also investing in them with the intention to use the Rivian um, EV battery chassis as a like a skateboard structure and they would just bolt on the cosmetic um, body of the car i mean do you see that being a disruptive force to um, tesla's position long term i don't necessarily because tesla is so vertically integrated that i think anytime there's some sort of you know partnership agreement like that there's added costs to doing that both sides want to collect their margin so it's just not a strategy that's going to yield uh the lowest cost to the consumer which unfortunately they have to compete with Tesla. That's laser focused on doing that. Um, so I don't think the value proposition is really going to be there for the, for the end consumer. You know, there might be a market for it. Not everyone likes how the Cybertruck looks for sure. Uh, people are going to want a more normal looking vehicle. So definitely they should pursue that niche. Uh, but in terms of, you know, becoming a dominant force, I don't think partnership is, is really the way to do it though. I do think a lot of automakers are going to sort of lean towards that to help, you know, manage through it because it's going to be uncomfortable and no one's going to like it. So I think partnerships is going to make them feel a little bit better about, you know, trying. <laughs> the other cool. thing I would say is that through, through the coronavirus situation, um, you know, it's obviously been an unfortunate circumstance, but it, it really highlights, I think, and accelerates disruption. They're 
the other automakers, most of them posted multi-billion dollar losses in Q2. Uh, I think the average was like a negative, you know, a $3 billion loss in net income. When companies are going through that, they're not as likely to, you know, spend the resources that they need to invest heavily in capital expenditures for new projects or uh, research and development, things like that. They're looking for ways that they can cut costs. You know, I live, I, I worked at Kohl's before uh, doing this Tesla daily stuff. And, you know, I saw day in, day out for seven years, just how a company like that gets disrupted by a company like Amazon. You know, the focus isn't on, on growth or capturing market share. The focus is on how do we stay alive and how do we, you know, somehow manage to eke out the same profits that we did last year. And with the coronavirus situation, just putting even more and more pressure on that, these other automakers are just going to cut these, you know, unnecessary short-term investments or long-term investments in favor of the short term. And we already saw an example of that, to your point on Ford and Rivian, uh, they had intended to launch a Lincoln branded uh, SUV on the Rivian platform that's canceled now. So they canceled that a couple months back. I still think they intend to eventually work together, but that's just sort of an example of um, sort of the impact of the macro environment situation right now. Great, yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, and I, I, one area too that I, that's slightly but um, relevant topic, slightly different. Um, you talked about the the, the truck. Um, so as as a, a Tesla like enthusiast and um, I, I, I presume like investor, I mean, how did, yep. did how do you how do you feel <laughs> when that that truck released? I mean, do you? Because because yeah, I think no, was, that was, some people really liked it and some people really didn't like it. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Was so I actually. I was actually able to be at that event. Uh, so I got to see it roll out there in person. And then, you know, there was a lot of shock, but I think I'm relatively even keeled just as a person. I don't really get shocked that easily. And, you know, Elon had given a lot of hints that this is going to look like some sort of like armored tank sort of personal carrier or something. So uh, I didn't really have a lot of expectations for it to look that much differently than it did. You know, I was definitely a little bit surprised with how it ended up looking and just sort of the, the geometric shape of it, I guess. Uh, but it was, it was along the lines of what I expected. So, you know, I think we did a live stream the day that that was, you know, the night that that happened, uh, me and a couple of my other Tesla following YouTube friends and, uh, you know, right away, you know, I saw the market potential for 500,000, a million vehicles per year of the Cybertruck, which I think a lot of people would, you know, scoff at right off the bat when seeing it, but you know, they've now reached the point where they've got about a million, uh, pre-orders for the truck, you know, those are only hundred dollars. They're fully refundable. So it doesn't mean all that much, but the interest has just been incredible despite sort of the, the glass breaking uh, faux pas that, <laughs> that they experienced during the, uh, the unveiling, which I do actually think helped them because it just generated so much more attention. <laughs> yeah. It, it, there's that saying, it's like, that's showbiz, you know, baby. <laughs> for <laughs> yeah. all we know, it could have been part of, part of the, uh, the entertainment. So, yeah. Okay. Be cool. Well, being there, it definitely was not intentional. Uh, Elon was very, very thrown off after that. You could tell he was just like, Oh my God, like, get me out of here. He dropped an F bomb, like right after it happened, it was slightly uncomfortable, but they got through it. So the new Roadster is supposed to be coming out soon, and it's like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I heard they get to pay for that, like all of it up front. Uh, what are your thoughts of the the Roadster? Do you think it's going to be successful? And do you think you'll be purchasing one? <laughs> I do not foresee a Roadster in my future quite yet. Uh, we'll see. So the two hundred fifty thousand reservation that's for like a founder's edition, so called. So it's sort of like a special, you know, vehicle if if people want to do that. The normal vehicle, I think you can reserve, uh, I don't want to mis misquote myself here, but I think it's like $20,000 to reserve. Uh, but this is obviously a high-end vehicle that, you know, it's not meant for volume. Uh, the way Elon put it, it's really just a smackdown on the on the internal combustion engine powertrain just to show that sort of in all all aspects, the electric powertrain can be superior so that there's just not, not anything motivating sort of that legacy uh, investment or anything like that anymore. If, if Elon can prove that really the electric powertrain is superior. So that's the essence of the Roadster. You know, it's not going to be a huge volume product for Tesla. It's not going to drive huge revenues, but it is going to be sort of that halo product for them. Um, if anyone's not familiar, the goal is uh, 1.9 seconds, 0 to 60, which would obviously be the fastest uh, production vehicle, which right now is actually the Tesla Model S, uh, 2.3 seconds. So, you know, it's, it's supposed to be basically a supercar, which for $200,000 is actually, you know, a really good deal. 
most of these cards are going to cost a million dollars, but um, yeah, I, I probably will not, not be purchasing one. I'm a little too practical for that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. As, as Pat knows well. <laughs> never, never has a truer statement been said. So. Yeah. I think you can get a, I think you can get a decent deal, Rob, on the original Roadster though. That may be a good investment as a collector, actually. I think they yeah, made a couple was, thousand of those. Yeah, I, I recently see one on the road. I know there's been a lot of um, press about them in terms of like Tesla sort of abandoning them from a warranty perspective and from a service perspective. And, you know, entrepreneurs have popped up as, you know, you know, their garages have popped up as just places where you can bring your Roadster if you have one um, because they're, you know, they're not really serviceable, but, you know, they're not... Tesla sort of phasing them out because they're, you know, it's expensive to continue to support it. Um, did you follow at all a gentleman who was at Tesla for a while by the name of John McNeil? Yeah. Then he went to uh, Lyft, I believe. Now I think he's somewhere else. Yeah. Now he's a, it, John's actually another Northwestern alum who I forgot to mention. Okay. He's actually a friend of mine. Um, nice. You know, he got recruited, he got recruited, you know, he got recruited by Elon personally. Um, to um to to go there he was based in boston actually um but he had he had been a serial entrepreneur in the automotive space um i was surprised he you know and then he left to become the coo at lyft and then he left lyft um to sort of go back to boston and become a you know an entrepreneur in residence at a major vc firm so um do you follow there, there seems to be a lot of senior management revolving door at tesla and how what do you attribute that to and is, is, does it bring up any concern for you as someone who follows them that closely? Yeah, this is, oh, sorry. This is a pretty consistent criticism um, of Tesla. And I haven't really seen much data on it, so I'm not really sure why it comes up other than just maybe perception. Um, if anyone can point me to data on it, I'd love to see it. But I think, you know, Tesla is just in the media so much that any executive departing gets, you know, 10 times more attention than any other automaker. Like no one even knows who the CFO of, you know, Chrysler is. Yeah. So I think Tesla's just, you know, there, there's a hyper, hyper focus on Tesla. So these things just get a lot more attention. Um, even if they do have a higher turnover rate though, Tesla's obviously a pretty difficult company to work for. You know, Elon is a very demanding CEO. Uh, they're, they're putting in a lot of work and, um, you know, Elon expects that from employees. Uh, so I think in a high pressure situation like that, I think it's probably pretty normal to see, you know, higher turnover. The other thing I would say is the leadership at the top, the very top in terms of the C-suite, I think has been pretty consistent. You know, Tesla's board members have, for the most part, um, they're pretty highly tenured. Um, and then specifically the CEO. So Elon Musk is, I think the, he's either the most tenured or the second most tenured CEO in the automotive industry. And even if we just look at, uh, the CEOs of other companies since um, the Model 3 was unveiled. Um, pretty much every other company has has had turnover there. I think GM sort of being the one exception, but we've seen, um, you know, Jaguar Land Rover, Audi, VW, BMW, um, sort of the list goes on and on of all these companies just in the last three years have had CEO turnover. And then, you know, they're just replacing them with a long tenured automotive executive. So, we're just not seeing that stability at the top and we're also not seeing sort of that disruptive uh, leadership perspective from, from any of their competitors. So long story short, that it's not something that, that concerns me. Um, I think Tesla's got a really amazing executive team in place right now. I think their CFO, Zach Kirkhorn, has done um, just an amazing job over the last, you know, sort of year, year and a half of uh, really reducing these operating expenses and communicating that to the market. And specifically, if we're talking about the stock, uh, Tesla, I think, has done so much better of a job of managing expectations in terms of their communication. You know, they would always set really aggressive public targets in the past and then just miss them. And, the, you know, the media would relentlessly harp on them for missing those targets. Uh, they've adopted a more conservative strategy now. And also just, you know, they give less frequent guidance and less specific guidance. And I think that's a big reason in terms of also in, in addition to just the operating leverage that they've generated uh, that we've seen the stock perform the way that it has over the last year. Well, thank you. A couple of quick questions. Joe, um, do you have... own a pair of Tesla short shorts? Uh, I actually bought quite a few pairs. They did oh, not did. ship yet. Yeah, I'm planning on maybe using them as uh, giveaways or something. 
Um, and just because they're limited edition too, like uh, who knows, maybe they could be a good investment too, but I'll probably end up doing them as, as giveaways on the channel. But I think I bought like 10 pairs, <laughs> even though they were $70 a piece, or $69.42 cool. a piece. No, it's, no good. It's, a, it's a good good investment logic. <laughs> um, any thoughts around the stock split that was just recently announced? Yeah, so obviously the stock was up 15% today. Uh, the market likes it. Obviously there's no fundamental change to the company in terms of the, the value. Um, but what the stock split does do is it allows potentially other investors to um, access the stock. So even with the advent of fractional share trading where people could purchase you know, a $200 lot of Tesla right now and own a sixth of a share, um, yeah. there are people that just aren't gonna do that in the first place. And secondly, not all brokerages offer it, especially internationally. So lowering the stock price just allows, you know, a more attainable price for the for the stock, which if we think about supply and demand logic, uh, just creates more demand, which is going to increase the price of the stock. So stock splits in general tend to have that impact. Uh, there's a study that was done by I think Rice University and then later at uh, Illinois University that found that over the first year after a stock split, uh, the stock outperforms the market by 8% and then by about 16 to 12% over the uh, following years. So in the three years following the stock split. So there is a precedence for overperformance. Obviously correlation doesn't equal causation on that, but um, I think, you know, a stock split expresses confidence from management that the stock is fairly valued and it's not going to fall significantly from the price that it's at and they actually expect it to, to increase. So I think there's a lot of that psychological impact uh, from the stock split as well as just opening it up to maybe some investors that, that wouldn't have bought before. And I actually have friends that were like that, you know, they, they had $1,500 that they could invest, but they don't just want to buy one share of one company. Now they can maybe buy a couple shares of Tesla and st you know still put some of their your, their money elsewhere. So I think it's a good thing. Very true. Um, one last question, which, um, and, uh, and if anyone a student has another question, we still have time for that. Um, like, how did you, I didn't look back in your history of some of your blog posts and such, but like the Joe Rogan situation, the, the tweeting about, you know, um, that got the SEC problem, got uh, Elon Musk in the trouble with the SEC. How did, you know, how did you look at that? What was your opinion of all those? You know, it seems like occasionally Elon goes off the deep end. Um, and, you know, and given everything he's got going on, I give him that, you know, I'm more than willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, and certainly the market has given him the benefit of the doubt. But how have you personally viewed that? Uh, yeah, similarly, I think, you know, just because I follow Tesla so closely and I follow Elon so closely that uh, none of those actions really surprised me. He's always sort of a shoot from the hip kind of guy. Um, so, you know, I think at times he, he can go a little bit too far. In 2018, there were definitely some instances on, on Twitter where he was tweeting some things that, you know, I didn't agree with or um, were detrimental to the Tesla's business. But, um, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I think he, you take the good with the bad. And as you said, I think, you know, Elon has proven overwhelmingly that, that it's majority good. And, you know, you can kind of fall back on that. No, no press is bad press sort of thing too. Like a lot of that does generate a lot of interest in Tesla. Maybe some people aren't going to buy a Tesla because of Elon Musk, but there are, you know, five others that just because of, you know, how he acts and, you know, his sort of stick it to the man mentality or non-conform, non-conformist mentality. I think uh, a lot of people sort of, uh, respect that and um, probably makes them more interested in, in supporting the company. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to follow. And, you know, that's, that helps, you know, what I do too. Yeah. you know, keep a track of Elon. <laughs> yeah. No, he, you know, it, 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 every day it's, it proves to be interesting to some yeah, extent, right? always something to talk about. Yeah. It's um, he's, do you view him as the current generation, Steve Jobs, you know, do you, do, do, do you draw any correlations to him and Jobs in terms of how closely watched he is and everything else? Yeah, I always tell people that if I would have been doing the podcast 10 years ago, it would have been about Apple. Uh, that was sort of my first significant investment. So I, I bought Apple in 2006 and still actually hold those shares. Um, Tesla for me is the new Apple and I think probably even more potential for, for Tesla yeah. than Apple had uh, just because of the, you know, the market that they're disrupting as, as I referred to earlier. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities, you know, right down to the sort of the intriguing personality and again, sort of that nonconformist mentality uh, that jobs had, you know, Musk definitely uh, embodies a lot of that. And I think they're both, you know, they're both uh, innovators. They've, they've pushed hard for, for innovation and 
um, eventually that was recognized in the, in the value of their companies. So I see a, a lot of, a lot of similarities, definitely not identical, but, um, definitely a lot of, a lot of similarities. And you're, that, that led to one last question I'll have, and I will not ask another question after this. Um, any, what's your, all, there was all this press around what Apple was doing in this space and their skunk works and everything else. And it seems like it's all gone for not is any sense, do you have any sense of what Apple is working on in the space or is it, is it more just traditional integration uh, and like expanding on the CarPlay foundation or do you, do you view Apple as someone who is looking to do something else? No, that's my sense. I think they're going to focus more on the software elements. Um, we'll see, you know, I'm sure they're still playing around with autonomy to see if there's, you know, some breakthrough that they could have there. I think there's an opportunity for a supplier um, to, I think there's an opportunity for a supplier to eventually come in and implement some sort of third party autonomous system. So, you know, Intel's mobile eye is definitely a player to watch sort of in that space. And these other, other automakers are, are going to need someone like that to help them. They're just not software developers at their core. So, um, you know, maybe Apple wants to play in that space. I'm sure they're working on a lot of different angles. I can't see them really bringing a vehicle to market, you know, for anyone that followed Apple closely, the speculation was for years that they were going to make a, a TV set and even something like that never came to fruition. Yeah. Um, I think the Apple car is probably a similar sort of situation where they've explored it. They just feel like the opportunity isn't, isn't there. And I think it refers back to what we had talked about earlier, where, you know, if they were to de develop a product, they have to compete with Tesla and Apple wants high margins. That's just pretty incompatible with a player like Tesla being in the market that, you know, they're not as focused on that. Um, yeah. It's just a really tough path and I can't see Apple, you know, going down that road. Yeah, no, makes sense. Any other questions from the class? Yeah, and I'm happy to talk to you about like the the business of, of Tesla daily if anyone has questions on that too. I know we didn't get into that quite as much. But if not, that's fine too. What is your background? Just curious. Yeah, um, so I went to school for marketing and entrepreneurship at Minnesota. And then out of, out of college, I worked at Kohl's in the buying office, um, so merchandising. Um, but I've always been interested in investing, always been interested in disruptive technology. And that's just always been sort of the, you know, the thing I would spend my time on after work. So I just eventually found a fit uh, with Tesla and, you know, I felt like people needed to hear more accurate information and I felt like I could provide that. Uh, the other thing for me was I just wanted to become a better speaker and I sort of reflected on, on that and realized that, okay, you know, I spent the last 25 years of my life, well, 22 years, whatever, sitting in a classroom, listening to people talk at me and I haven't really done a whole lot of speaking myself. So obviously, you know, my brain's not going to be wired for that. So that was actually the reason I chose to do Tesla daily on a daily basis was because I felt like that would be the best way for me to improve my, my speaking ability. Uh, and it's definitely helped. So if anyone wants to do that, I'd recommend, recommend starting a daily podcast. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? So what do you think, what do you think keeps um, Elon Musk and Tesla up at night? You know, what is their imminent threat or potential disruptor to Tesla and all their success that you've just beautifully laid out? Yeah, I think, um, and Elon would say himself, he doesn't really worry too much about competition. Tesla's really just focused on making the best product they can. And they believe that's the path for success, uh, which I agree with. So what keeps them up at night is how they can continue to grow and how they can continue to um, maximize the number of electric vehicles uh, out there. So that goes back to our battery conversation. Really, that's the main constraint, and that's likely to be the main constraint for the next decade. So I'm sure what keeps them up at night is okay. How can we, uh, you know, leverage that supply chain and and maximize the growth within that supply chain to get the resources that we need to uh, accelerate our mission? That makes sense. Great. Well, Rob, we really want to, I want to say sincere thanks for taking the time out on, a, on an evening, um, potentially impacting or you're delaying your dinner um, to speak with us. Um, I truly personally found it very insightful. I will be following you going forward. Um, and um, I would never, you know, 
I walked into this thinking, you know, I definitely walked into this believing Tesla was an overpriced stock. I leave, I leave with a, a very different understanding and respect for the entity and what it's doing. Um, and, you know, thank you for uh, providing that. I think all of us, um, I think your argument is, you know, is, is a valid one and one that um, gets lost in the way the press tends to follow companies like Tesla, right? It's all about the longs versus the shorts. And there's a lot more there than that. And you drill down on it in the next little presentation around it. So um, on behalf of myself and the entire class, thank you for your time. It was very, um, it was very insightful. And, you know, and um, I, as well as everyone else I know, learned a um, significant amount in, uh, this, this evening. So thank you. And we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Very happy to do it. Really appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity. Thank you.